The children sang their praises, the simplest, the best. From all of that they followed, for the exalted crowd, the victor palm branch wavy, chanting clear and loud, the Lord of earth and heaven, Rode on in lowly state, nor scorned the little children to be his bidding way. Hosanna, loud Hosanna, the gentlemen we sing, for Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven, our King. Oh, may we ever praise him with his lifted voice and in his blissful presence eternally rejoice. Good morning. morning. Hosanna, loud hosannas, for the kingdom of God is at his hand. He has not come to take a crown or to sit upon an earthly throne. He has come that he might bring reconciliation into the human heart. (laughs) Hosanna, loud hosannas. We worship Jesus and Lord and Savior. You may be seated. As we turn to a time of prayer, uh, some notes to be lifted up. George Largent is not doing well. Uh, He hasn't been sleeping. Uh, His breathing has been labored. Uh, Very elevated heart rate. Keep George and the rest of the Largent family in your prayers for the coming days. Chad Clark scouting friend Ryan Miller um, had a stroke. Uh, he was in his mid forties. Uh, prayers for Ryan in his recovery. Uh, Lonnie Dishon had uh, knee surgery this week on Tuesday. Surgery was a success. Uh, he's been up and walking with a walker. Continued prayers for his healing. Janet Freeman's sister-in-law Claudia had fluid on her brain drain this week. Uh, prayers for Claudia and her recovery. Uh, We continue to uh, lift up uh, the victory for Angela Harner uh, in completing her chemo treatments. She should be having the scan this week uh, to uh, hopefully confirm that she is now cancer-free. Continue prayers for Norma and Gary Hovermill. Uh, Kathy Largent's mother, Sister Barbara Barry, had a pacemaker installed on Wednesday, The surgery was a good success, and uh, based on a phone call last night, uh, she's sounding stronger and and in better spirits. So uh, uh, continued prayers for Sister Barbara Berry as she uh, continues to recover. Uh, Dan Malcolm's best friend, Greg, um, a Marine brother, uh, for over 50 years, had a severe stroke. He passed away this morning. Uh, Julie and Dan were still on their way to Florida, they did not make it in time to see him. Uh, Dan is the executor of, of his estate. Uh, so continue prayers for Julie and Dan as they go down to Florida to deal with uh, this loss and uh, everything else that goes with it. Continue prayers for Kevin with his healing. Uh, Kathy Rager's friend Elizabeth, continue prayers uh, in seeking housing. Uh, continue prayers for the people of Ukraine and those suffering from covid We will give you opportunity to lift up names uh, in the course of our prayer. And to each of those, we will answer, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us turn to God with our prayers.
Hosanna, loud Hosannas. We lift and wave the victor palms, for we know we have victory in Christ Jesus, our Savior, who redeems us and reconciles us to the image of God in which we were created. We come this day that we might continue to worship your name, give praise to all that has been done, all that you do, all that continues to happen in your good plan. Give you thanks, for we know that all good things come from your hand. You bless us daily. Those things that enter into our lives giving us joy, even giving us challenge that we might overcome through you. We have lifted up those places where we hope to see your spirit move and heal, to bring intervention and peace and strength to those we add to the list, naming them one by one. Lord, hear our prayers. Joe Schaefer. Lord, hear our prayers. Richard Emmett. Lord, hear our prayers. Jessica Purifoy. Lord, hear our prayers. Zoe wants to say Ruby. Lord, hear our prayers. An acquaintance, Tammy, whose son passed away from an overdose. Lord, hear our prayers. We look forward to your spirit moving in and amongst all of these, bringing strength and peace, healing and comfort. Pour out your full measure upon us as well as we continue in our walk of faithful discipleship, seeking to follow in the example of Christ who went before, reaching out to the people who were in need, help us to have a heart to be able to respond where you call us to go. In all of these things, we seek to follow his example and to live out the words he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite the children to come forward. <clears throat> How are we doing today? Good? 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 Everyone's good? Everyone's good? All right. It's a good day. It's a good day. I want to know who was up till 11 o'clock last night with me watching the race. No NASCAR fans? Oh, Peggy and Bruce aren't here. Oh, Peggy and Bruce. Because they're at a racetrack at a... I, I called Bruce yesterday. He's at Lowe's Motor Sport Speedway at a car swap. Where do you do a car swap at a NASCAR track? Nobody else is a NASCAR fan? Oh my goodness, well then, this will shock you. You'll all be surprised, and now you'll be fans. Just for this one thing. I know it. So, I like NASCAR. I like baseball. But I like NASCAR because there's one thing very unique and special about NASCAR. 
So during the pre-race, the pre-pre-race, it always ends with Michael Waltrip, who's kind of a country bumpkin, walking up and down. Now you're shaking your head yes, like you've seen this. <laughs> Starts walking up and down the grid, talking to the drivers and filling in space before the actual pre-race ceremonies begin. And sometimes that's a long time, and he fills in all that time, and sometimes it's really quick to get ready to go. But when he kicks it off, he kicks it to Race Central, and the very first thing they do is post the colors. Post the colors. They present the flag. The old days, it was because the party doesn't start till the king comes, right? Or whoever is the most important person in the room. But for us, that's so you present the colors. Because once the colors are presented, then the party can start. And the very next thing they do is pray. they pray. They have an invocation. See, nobody watches NASCAR. I don't know. They pray. They take time and stop and pray before the race. No other sports league does that. Do you realize that? No other. They don't do it at the baseball games. They don't do it at the football games. Before they race, they present the colors, and the very first thing they do, very first thing they do is they pray. They honor God. That's pretty cool. The church I served before this, all the way in the back, because it was a long, narrow sanctuary, all the way in the back, always sat the high school varsity football coach. Actually, baseball coach. Baseball coach. And at the games, before the game would start, he would always tell one of his captains that they should go and talk to the other captain of the other team and invite them as well. But his boys would go and meet at center court, and one of the students would lead a prayer. And they'd invite the other team to come, anyone that wanted to, and meet them at center court, and they'd have a prayer. And back just before we left up there, one of the last games that they had, because then COVID broke out, one of the reporters took a picture of the entire varsity base basketball team with the entire other basketball team all kneeled at center court for a prayer. Because it was loved by the students. That's kind of cool, isn't it? It's a witness of what can be done. NASCAR is the only sport that chooses to take time before their event to pray. And what I hope it will remind you guys is that you can choose to do the same thing. You can choose at any time to take a moment and honor God and pray. That's kind of cool, right? And if you do that, you witness to other people what's important to you. And that goes for everyone out there, too. Not just them, right? Amen. Who's going to watch the next NASCAR event just to see if I'm right? <laughs> Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for the ways in which we can witness our faith and honor you. Help us to remember we can always turn to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray this moment. Amen. Thank you for coming up here. All you secret NASCAR fans.
That's why I was up till 11 o'clock to watch. <laughs> Just because I've seen it doesn't mean I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Uh, The scripture today is Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt <clears throat> that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If, you ask, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, the owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had, been, they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to them, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, If I tell you these were silent, the stones would also shout out. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills, once cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant a blessing on this time spent that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard. They will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. A wizened and seasoned preacher once did a sermon with this same title. And I, as a student associate pastor, was there and, and found it quite captivating. And I wasn't smart enough to grab a copy of the text so that I would ever be able to utilize that. But I've used the concept several times since. This story basically has two kinds of people. Palm wavers and donkey fetchers. Palm wavers are the masses of the people. Some of them even knew who Jesus was. They had probably been in a crowd somewhere over the course of his ministry and seen one of those miracles he had performed. Maybe they had been present when he fed the multitudes on the hillside or even chased him across the sea to try and get the free meal the next day when he rebuked them. The palm wavers are the masses. And they came and they waved their palms and some of them knew who Jesus was supposed to be. Some of them didn't. Some of them just happened to show up and see that there was a parade and we're waving our palms and so they gave them a palm too. Wave your palms. 
Hosanna, Hosanna, why are we waving our palms? Well, this guy is coming. Hosanna, Hosanna, who is he? Oh, he's a king. Hosanna, Hosanna. Throw your coat down. Throw your, he's got to, he can't st- Throw your coat down. Hosanna, Hosanna. And it's not hard to connect the dots between the people who are calling Hosanna on Sunday to the crowd five days later calling crucify, crucify. What's the crowd doing? Oh, they're going to they're gonna kill this guy. Crucify, crucify. Say it, call it out, crucify. Well, hold it, isn't that the guy who... No, nah, don't worry about it. Crucify, crucify. Because palm wavers have a faith that's kind of shallow. And they show up for the big events. And they wave their palms. Another group of people. Donkey fetchers. Jesus told a couple of the disciples, hey, now go down the street, and when you get down there, there's going to be a donkey tied up. Now today's set a colt. Some say a colt, and some say a donkey, but we always depict it as a donkey in all the pictures. It's a pretty little donkey. There's a donkey down there. Just go on down there and untie it and bring it back. And, uh, Jesus, I was watching this John Wayne movie, and they, they strung that guy up. <laughs> No, don't worry about it. Just go on down there, and if someone asks you, just tell them, your master needs the donkey and bring it back. Yeah, but that was the guy who strung the guy up. And we don't know who it was. They aren't named. But we can see where it would take a deeper amount of faith to go down the street and get the donkey. And when you get there and you're confronted, no, these aren't the droids you're looking for. Some of you get that. Jedi mind tricks. No, my master needs the donkey. And bring the donkey back. But before you get too busy patting yourself on the back for being a donkey fetcher, remember that it's the donkey fetchers who on Sunday went and fetched the donkey, and on Thursday were so busy doing all the things needed to fetch the donkey of that day that they forgot to wash their feet for dinner. And Jesus had to wash their feet. And then it was that biggest donkey fetcher of them all, who said, Jesus, you're not washing my feet. Jesus said, no, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. To which Peter said, well, hey, you know what? My hands are kind of dirty, and I forgot to wash my hair today. And so those donkey fetchers who over the course of the next 24 hours, one by one by one, left him abandoned him and denied they ever knew him. So we have a day where maybe we're a palm waver, maybe we're a donkey fetcher. And there are times where we're palm wavers and in our faith we get excited by the big events, chase after the pretty new thing. And there are other times where we get so caught up into the things that need to be done and we forget the joy. And so we wonder whether we're a donkey fetcher or we're a palm waver and we think on that for a while, 
And that all works right up until two days ago until we met as a cluster right here and that same wizen senior pastor was sitting at the table with us in cluster because he's now interim over at Blanchester, Dean Feldmeyer. And he goes, you know, I remember that sermon. And I always thought that part of the thing was that Jesus gave them the magic words. My master has need of it. Now, I forgot to tell them it was the magic words, and so, yeah, all the other dynamic works out. But he gave them the magic words, and it was all kind of a setup. And that's part of the point. The whole week, the whole week is a setup. From Palm Sunday to Easter morning, and we know the words and the stories and the rituals and the things that we're supposed to do that help deepen and give us more understanding to this great big story. And it's all a setup. Because Jesus came to Jerusalem that day knowing what was to happen next. And he knew what kind of a reception was waiting for him. And he told the disciples to go and bring him the donkey. We're going to go and fulfill some prophecy today. Go and get that donkey. And we're going to ride in. And we're going to wave the palm. And we've heard the stories. And we know the connections. And we know that these palms are palms of a false victory. And that's why we keep these palms all year long. And then in the springtime, we take the dried out palms and we burn them up and they're used for the next year's ashes. Because from the false victory comes the promise of how we start our Lenten season. And it's all hardwired into the system. So we come to this day of Palm Sunday. And if we aren't careful, we miss the significance and some of the points. And we wave the palms with the kids. But we know it's false. And we set it aside. We all wait for that big Easter moment because we know it's coming. That's the point. It's in the fine details of the story that I think we miss some of the significance. We tell the story over and over again and we get into the things that we think are the big moments and all of it is interconnected. And I think it's in one of the smallest little details that we miss one of the biggest, biggest moments. Jesus meets Pilate on Good Friday. And they have a conversation. Why are you here? You know they've brought you here for me to condemn you to death. They say you're a king. My kingdom is not of this place. And so he's sentenced to death. He's taken to the cross. And Pilate says, make a sign to put over the cross that says, King of the Jews. And the religious leaders get all upset over that. 
Don't do that. No, I've said what I have said and written what I have written. And so over Jesus' cross, it says, King of the Jews. And you know why they do that. So that you know as the passerby why this person is being condemned and why they die. And so over the thief, it says, thief. So that you know that if you steal and if you're a thief, this is what's going to happen to you. And over Jesus' head, it says, King of the Jews. I'll think on that. It's an important note. Because the crime should have been insurrection. The crime should have been treason. The crime should have been rebellion. He claimed to be king. There can be only one king. Caesar is king. But no, Pilate says, I have said what I have said. I have written what I have written. It said, king of the Jews. And by Pilate's statement, this is fact. Jesus is recognized as king of the Jews, and that is is why he is sentenced to die. Condemned and sent there by the religious leaders who called him king and gave him the victor's welcome to Jerusalem on Sunday morning. Hosanna. Hosanna. Welcome the king. We say it all the time. Jesus was king. That was the point. They just didn't understand king of what? Right? King of what? King in the heart. King of our salvation. King of our redemption. For that he died. I wonder today whether we get the message any better. Sometimes we become so caught up in waving the palms, victory in Jesus, victory in Jesus, and do we see that as king of the heart and anybody's heart, or is it just my heart, just our heart, and we make it exclusive? And we lock other people out from it. And we make the victory false. Or do we get caught up in being a donkey fetcher and following all the rules, and those who follow the rules, they're the ones who are saved. Jesus came that all who believed would be saved. We came into this Lenten season seeking to deal with the monkeys in our lives. Monkeys. The challenges, the chaos, the failings. And the truth is, we all got monkeys. That was the first lesson, right? Everybody's got monkeys. It's just a matter of trying to figure out what monkeys you got. And dealing with the monkeys. Trying to make the monkeys be something just a little less so God could be something just a little bit more. And we only had time to deal with a few monkeys. There's lots of monkeys out there. Lots and lots of monkeys. The first monkey was the monkey of fear. 
Because sometimes we run into the things that we're afraid of and it stops us in our tracks. And it overwhelms us. And we won't do another thing. Because we run into the fears of what could be, what might be. Sometimes it's even the fears of being successful at it. Then we confronted the monkey of shame. I'm going to get six and seven and two. In my mind, it was 30. Then I got up to 20. Trying to help move and clean up my father in law's house after his raid. Change happens all around us, and we do everything we can to keep and maintain everything right the way it is. We invest our all into staying exactly where we're at, and yet God created and put us in a world that changes every single moment with every single breath of Rather than embrace the idea of change, I embrace the nature of creation. Then we took it to a more personal level and dealt with the monkey of relationship. God may be separate from us, but God put us in an earth with 8.5 billion other people that he created exactly in his image, just like us. And do we seek to make relationship with them, or do we seek to wall them out? No, the ones like us, that's okay. But God called us to serve all made in his image. Then the last one. We went to where the monkey comes from. The monkey of addiction. been in a couple meetings of late where we have talked about people's obsession with their crickets. Someone that has a cricket machine knows what I mean. You want to see it, go down to Joanne's Fabrics or Michael's and go and look at the cricket area and watch the ladies come in and get excited about the stuff that they can do with their crickets. And from a hobby to an obsession. We have our obsessions. We all have our obsessions that take us to Charlotte to see cars being swapped that we can't swap with, but, you know, that's okay. But sometimes the obsession takes a point where it consumes the whole of our lives and it destroys everything within our lives. And it becomes addictive. And some of us run into that. And do we seek to help to reach out, to show compassion, acceptance, care, or do we wall those people away? Do we offer redemption or condemnation? And that's only a handful of the monkeys 
that we deal with on a daily basis. So we come to today, Palm Sunday, and we're given the victor's palms. And so often we leave these to the kids. And we'll collect up whatever is left in the pews. And I'll hang on to them all year long. And they'll dry up in my office, and a couple weeks before Ash Wednesday, I'll take them out with any prayers that we have written down over the course of the year and burn them up and make the ash. But you know what? We buy some extras. So I know that I've got palms, no matter what happens. And I've already got a collection of ash, though I always have to make some more. But if you should just happen to want to take one of these, that's what they're for. So that you can hang it up on the wall and remember Remember all year long that it is not a false victory. We have victory in Jesus. Victory if we've given him our heart. A victory if we follow in his example. A victory if we accept his forgiveness and his salvation. And that victory is not just one day. And every time you look at the palm, you see it and you remember that victory that is daily had in Christ. Because Christ is the King. And we do call out, Hosanna. Loud Hosanna. And we claim that victory today, every single day in our faith. Amen. As we prepare to leave today, let me offer this prayer of thanks for the offering you will be giving and the offering plates in the back of the sanctuary. Triumphant God, we echo the shouts of Hosanna as we relive the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and all that waits in the week to come. Like the first parade so long ago, we may have different ideas of what kind of Messiah we long to welcome. Many of us seek one who thinks like we think, who will weld power to meet our longings. As we give our gifts this morning, may we be of the heart and mind of submission. You know better than us the Messiah that is needed for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
is our beginning in our time infinity in our doubt is our believing in our lives eternity in our death a resurrection at the last a victory unrevealed until its season something god alone can see go in peace